All right, so a couple weeks ago, I had the chance to speak with you, and we started talking about the resurrection of the dead, and I left you with this uh, slide that I can't seem to get to. That one's a battery dead on this thing. There it is. What happens to those who never knew Christ or even heard the gospel? That was the question I left you with, and I said, next time, God willing. So God willing, we're here, as long as I have breath and, and the, the ability to think and not say Ethan when I mean William, we are going to go through this subject further today. But one of the things about this in terms of the question, what happens to those who never knew Christ? I will take you back, as I did last time, to the remembrance I had as a child listening to missionaries come into our church and talking about the fact that if we didn't get the message out and people weren't able to hear it, and that there were people dying in China and Africa, having never heard the word of God, you know, the Philippines and Thailand and all these places, that they were all condemned to hell forever. And I remember even thinking, wow, that's a, that seems harsh. Because they never heard, they never had the chance to accept Christ. But as God has shown me, and as I've looked into the word of God over time, the revelation of the plan and the purpose and the ways that God works, I didn't find that revealed. In fact, I see that the Bible teaches us something else. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, let's just do a quick recap of what did we learn in part one of the resurrection of the dead. And if you didn't know what that ROTD means, that's it. Resurrection of the dead, part one. So first, the resurrection of the dead. It's a prophecy. It's a doctrine. And it's also an aspect of the gospel. We saw that the resurrection uh, of those who have died, they're dead, death. That really it means to have a cessation of a life. And the Bible refers to it over 20 times as something like sleep. It talks about, uh, last time we saw that Satan's first lie to mankind was not that you would die, but that you will, you will not surely die. A lie that has been believed by religions and mankind ever since, that you will not surely die. Fourth, we saw that God contrasts the reward penalty of judgment as life versus death. We read this all the time. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But we somehow translate the wages of sin is life somewhere else or life being tortured forever or tormented forever. You know, or even John 3, 16, one of the most famous gospel verses, right? That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish. But yet somehow we translate that. And as a kid, again, I heard that you would be burning alive forever and ever and ever and ever being tormented forever. Does the Bible really say that? And see, the thing is going into the word of God and listening to God's word and the truth on this subject should help us to see that God revealed a plan. And it's not based on Dante's Inferno. It's not based on works of fiction. It's not based on the God of Hades and Pluto and all the things that came out of uh, Roman and Greek mythology that have so invaded the church of, the, uh, of Christians where we are looking at things and believing in things that actually you, you just don't see it taught as the doctrine. So that we want to talk about that further today. We found out last week we're not immortal, that we do not have immortal souls. Ezekiel chapter 18 and also Matthew chapter 10. Talk about the destruction of the soul, that God has the power to do that in hellfire. We saw that no one has ascended to heaven at any time, that only Jesus Christ, who was resurrected. Now, I say they're in a resurrected body because someone brought up, what about Paul in, first, in a 2 Corinthians chapter 14? Yes, that's not what we're talking about, but rather the resurrection to a spiritual body. Because even Jesus, in coming back to life from death... Right? Elijah resurrected the child. Elisha, right? Even Jesus himself was resurrecting people. But not to a spiritual body, to an ascension into a heavenly place. Only Jesus Christ received that spiritual body. And in fact, he is called the firstborn from the dead. So obviously, it has a different connotation than those resurrections. The dead come back to life via the resurrection of the dead. That's the way that it happens. 1 Corinthians 15. There's a resurrection to life and there's a resurrection to condemnation. So if you didn't know about that, that there is a resurrection that's spoken about to condemnation in Daniel 12 and John 5. Next, we saw in 1 Corinthians 15 that there's a preset order and timing to the resurrections. It doesn't just happen throughout, but actually God said that there is an order to this. 
We saw that those who believe in God pass from death to life and do not enter into judgment. So there is a, there is a grace that comes when we believe in Jesus. The Bible teaches that there's a resurrection of the dead in Christ at the return of Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 showed us that. And the Bible teaches there is a resurrection of the dead at the end. And so that's where we want to pick up. So we learned quite a bit, and I wanted to review that because there's a lot of scriptures that we read last time, and we're going to continue on. Overall, in these two weeks, we'll probably cover somewhere uh, over, well over 200 verses. So for those who are Christ, what do we have hope in? That there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. As we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, when does the resurrection happen? At the return of Jesus Christ. The dead in Christ rise first. Those who are alive and remain are caught up to meet him in the air. In 1 Corinthians 15, it said, each in his own order. Christ the first roots, then what? Those who are Christ's at his coming. So Paul, when he's writing this, is confirming that is the timing, not only to me, but all those who love his appearing, all those who love his coming, because we're all going to be gathered together to the Lord at that time. He's gathering together his priests and his saints. Notice here as well in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? So this concept of resurrection of the dead, this concept of being raised up at the return of Jesus Christ is throughout the scriptures, and Paul refers to it and teaches on it directly, but also makes reference to it at other places, and it should be part of our understanding as well. So there's a question we have. What happens to those who never knew Christ or even heard the gospel? What does it say about them? Notice with me here. Oh, I didn't even give you the question, did I? There it is. What happens to those who never knew Christ or even heard the gospel? So let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28. It says, so now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So again, you can read in the book of Revelation, you can read in the writings of Paul, Christ is the firstborn from the dead. In fact, it says, if he is not resurrected, everybody's dead. His resurrection began something, and that is a coming back to life. Resurrection means to bring back to life, and Jesus Christ is the first. So since by man came death, and that's what we all have assur assurances of, that we will die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those who are Christ that is coming. But then notice, then comes the end. This next period of time when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. So again, when we talk about death, and the reason I'm, I've made the point with you, do we actually believe what it says when it says the wages of sin is death? Or that dying is it, having a cessation of life. That death itself is not being off somewhere in torment and torture for billions of millions of zillions of years. But rather, death is something that happens when there's a cessation of life. And what he's saying is, death itself is going to be destroyed. Death is the enemy. Because what death does is it creates an absence of fellowship. It takes us apart from one another because somebody is dead. And now what are we doing? We're mourning the loss of fellowship, of relationship. And, and, and Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm going to put an end to this. So this is a beautiful promise that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And so when he puts all things under his feet, now when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. That seems a little confusing, doesn't it? But God the Father put all things under Jesus Christ, but it's understood that the Father wasn't putting himself under Christ, but he was putting all things under his Son. So now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Amen. Our Holy Father has the, uh, the supreme authority. So Christ is in submission to the Father. Some would teach doctrine that they're equal in power and authority, but actually the Bible reveals something very different, that actually Christ does not have authority over the Father. The Father has authority over his Son, and thus it shall always be when the Son himself takes of what the Father gave him, 
delivers it to his father and becomes subject to his father. It is a very beautiful thing about the way the relationship of the family works. The family of God, father, his firstborn, only begotten son, and all his adopted kids, we all love our father and give glory to our father in heaven. And so Jesus does this. So there is this resurrection, this timing at the end. So let's look at this. Revelation 20, verse 4, it says this. I saw thrones and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads, and on their hands, or on their hands, I should say, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So we see that when Jesus is talked of the firstborn from the dead in Revelation 1, it was by his blood that he cleansed us, sanctified us, called us out to be kings and priests. And Revelation 5 talks about that. And then in Revelation 11, at the last trumpet that we talked about last time, there is this time of the gathering of the saints, and there's this time of them coming together, and then actually returning with Christ in Revelation 19. And now we see when Christ and his saints come back to the earth, he establishes his kingdom on the earth. And this is what John is prophesying about, seeing thrones. Because it was prophesied in Daniel that God would give his kingdom into the hands of his saints. And they would rule and reign with the king, Jesus Christ. And this a kingdom will be established on the earth. This is the hope of the coming of Jesus. That he will gather his saints unto him. And he will then gather them for a time and then come to earth together to establish his kingdom on the earth. There are many prophecies about this. If you ever have any questions about that, please feel free to ask me about it. I'd be glad to go through the word of God on that subject if I don't speak on it sooner. So they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But notice this phrase, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Now one of the most straightforward sayings in the Bible in regard to the doctrine of what happens when people die is they don't live again until the thousand years are finished. So if the thought is that all that have died are living again somewhere, then where does this verse even fit in? What relevance does it have? And what I'm trying to show you as we go through these words is that the Bible actually has a very clear story and plan that it reveals of what is actually happening and we neglect it. And so verses like this get read right over. The rest of the dead do not live. Because if we think they're alive somewhere else, then they are living again. There is no need for a resurrection if you have life somewhere else. The whole point of resurrection is that you don't have life. There's been cessation of life. And now you need to be raised back up. So the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. So, who is a part of the first resurrection? Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. And again, you can refer back to uh, Revelation chapter 1 that said that God sanctified us by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we would be his kings and his priests. All those who are Christ's at his coming have a part in the first resurrection, and over such, the second death has no power. In other words, they don't die. Jesus promised that if we would believe in God the Father who, was, uh, who sent Jesus to the earth, he said in John 5 that when we believe, we pass from death to life. We have the ultimate promise of resurrection, and over such, the second death has no power. That's the beauty of being called. That's the beauty of the honor and the privilege that it is to know Jesus Christ and to receive the gospel message implanted that we are being set apart by Jesus Christ, by his very blood, by his very sacrifice, and by the power of his resurrection to be children of God, to be kings and priests, to rule and reign with him. He wants his saints to be engaged, and his saints will be. And all this was playing out in type in Israel when he gathered out his people and he was giving them life in a promised land, and he chose out a priesthood. He is doing the same thing, to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. It's right there. Isn't that beautiful? Now let's drop down to after the thousand years. So during the thousand-year period of time, Satan was bound before these, this kingdom was set up. That was kind of what happened when Christ came with his saints in Revelation 19. He went against those 
who were coming against him, his saints were coming with him. He took Satan and it says he bound him for a thousand years. That's how one reign ends, Satan being bound for a thousand years. Then Christ's disciples uh, and, and those who are believers being set up to reign with him for a thousand years. And at the end of that thousand years, Satan is actually released to go uh, to deceive the nations. But then at the end of the thousand years, when he, Satan has deceived the nations, it says that fire will come from heaven and destroy those who are against God. And then Satan himself will be cast into the lake of fire. And as soon as that happens, then it says, Then I saw a great white throne here in Revelation 20, verse 11. I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So if you were not one of Christ's at his coming, it says all the rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years are finished. But now here they are being gathered before the Lord and books are opened and judgment takes place. I want you to see how clearly this, this is stated here in these verses of a prophecy that they were all judged according to their works. Now you realize the contrast that is taking place between those who are Christ's and those who are the rest of the dead who are not Christ's. Because those who are Christ, what did we say? Don't judge me by my works. I judge myself worthy of death. I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I die. Jesus, forgive my sins. Wash them away. I need a Savior to give me life. He gives us life. And in that faith, we are given the Holy Spirit and the assurance of eternal life. Eternal life that comes by belief and faith in Jesus. But the rest of the dead, they don't have this faith and believe in Jesus. What are they left with in the judgment? It's actually the very things of works. That's a scary place to be, my friends. Because ultimately, there's a resurrection here at the end, and books are open, and the dead were judged according to what they did. But, while it can be scary to think about God judging us according to our works because we can think, you know, maybe our minds run to the sins that we've committed and maybe not the acts of kindnesses so quickly. The one who's sitting on the throne is ready to make a judgment. And his judgment is pure. And it's good. And it's true. And there's no one more qualified than God Almighty to do this. Notice with me as we continue on. So it says, They're judged according to their works by the things written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. Did you know that hell's being destroyed? Hades? Hades will be destroyed. Death itself will be destroyed. The same word, uh, Thanatos, uh, there for, the, for death being cast into the lake of fire that we talked about last week. Death in Hades will be cast in the lake of fire. It's the second death. It's putting an ending to dying. That's one of the great glorious parts of the gospel of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, that God will put an end to death. And what you read in the next chapter, one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible when John is saying, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, what did he say? There was no more sorrow, nor crying, nor death, nor pain, because the former things have passed away. See, this is a part of the glorious plan to understand that he's taking this away, this pain of death. And death is an enemy that needs to be destroyed. And death is the last enemy that will be destroyed. Because all those who are not in the book of life find what? They find death. So God will make this judgment. And he said, anyone not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. And so he makes a final judgment for those who have lived. So back to John 5 that we, we started on last week. Let's look at this again. So as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, this is John 5, 21 to 30, even so, the Son gives life to whom he will. Who gives life? The Son. 
Jesus is the judge. He's the one the Father has committed judgment to. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So there is an honoring of the Son that is a part of this. And always remember to give the glory to Jesus Christ. God the Father set him up that in all things he would have the preeminence, including even being the firstborn from the dead. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And notice, shall not come into the judgment, but is passed from death to life. So there's the beauty of those who are Christ at his coming. But now notice also what it says here. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. We have the hope and promise and, yes, even the guarantee of eternal life by faith in Jesus Christ. So those will hear and live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So do not marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. So again, where are people who die? In the graves. The time is coming, though, when they will hear the voice. And notice what happens. Those who have done good, they come to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, what did we just read in Revelation? We said that all the dead would come before him, and it said what? They would all be judged, each one according to his works. What does Jesus say here? It says those who have done good works to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil works to the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus can make that judgment. See, we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but here is Jesus talking about a judgment according to works. What brings us to life? Is it works or by faith? Faith. That is how we become one of Christ at his coming. That is how we are having the hope and assurance of the resurrection of the dead, that when Christ comes down, we will rise up. The dead rise first. Those who are alive and remain rise up to meet him. We're gathered together with the Lord. And as the Lord then comes back to this earth... We will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. But all the rest of the dead, those who are still dead, those who haven't had a life somewhere else, but rather have been waiting in their graves, they're going to be woken. They're going to be called awake. A resurrection to judgment. And those who have done good are going to be raised to a resurrection of life. And those who have done evil to a resurrection of condemnation. Jesus said, I can do nothing. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now, this is a beautiful thing when, again, you're thinking about, well, what about all the rest of the dead? What about the people that never heard the gospel? What about, you know, Aunt Joni or Uncle Bob or all the people that you might know that they they didn't know? There's no one more qualified to sit on the throne and make a judgment than Jesus Christ. Because the judgment he will make of the rest of the dead will be according to the will of the Father. It's going to be perfect, and it's going to be righteous, and it's going to be true. And the thing is that there is a judgment for those who are the rest of the dead that, that Jesus will be making at that time. Notice in 2 Timothy 4.1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. There is a timing to when this will happen. Notice this, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to this by raising him from the dead. And so remember as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, what did it say? That if Jesus is not raised from the dead, everybody's dead. It said that the dead have perished. <laughs> it's like they're, they're just gone. There's no hope. But he gave us assurance the gospel is founded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But notice here, even of angels, for God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. 
again, notice the reservation. Even though in prison, there is a time of judgment even for them. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the worlds of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. I want you to notice that reference to Sodom and Gomorrah because we're going to come back to that later. And I'm reading stuff that you guys don't have, huh? <laughs> Sorry. There it is. Second Peter 2, 4 to 9. All right. So, so turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah there into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. The plan all along has been there's a day of judgment. And judgment is to come at the end, after the thousand-year reign of Christ and his saints on the earth. Second Peter 3, verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. And so there is a resurrection of condemnation and a time of judgment at the end. Notice here in Jude as well. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And so there is a warning to all of us to understand that we have been given life, but we should not turn away or think that others have not turned away from the calling that they've had. And so as even Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Amen. All right, let's turn now to Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Romans 2, 5 to 16. So notice this. So in accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And one of the things that I think is interesting is sometimes people talk about the wrath and how we're not appointed to wrath. We hear the writing that is going out in the book of Romans to the church is also talking about the world in which they live and talking about in chapter 1 about those who don't acknowledge the creation. They're basically heaping up for themselves destruction. But also, those who are judging others here in Romans chapter 2, not realizing that why are you judging people? Don't you realize you're doing the very same things? And it's Paul's saying, stop the judgment and look at what we're doing here. And so he's saying that there is this time of judgment and that uh, in accordance with the hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of righteous judgment of God. God has not appointed us to wrath, but man who is apart from God could be facing wrath in the day of judgment. Now notice, what will he do? He is going to render in that time of judgment to everyone according to his deeds. Now, I know in the Christian church this seems odd. I've had many people ask me about these verses, but did you read with me that twice it was stated in Revelation they would be judged according to their works? Did you read with me in John that, they, that those who did good would have a resurrection to life and those who had done evil to a resurrection of condemnation? And do you notice Paul here speaking again about this time of judgment and the time of judgment of God that each one would be judged according to his deeds? See, there is a judgment that is to come, and the judgment is not the same as it is for those who are believers in Christ. Because the believers in Christ do what? They judge their works as worthy of death, and therefore they accept the salvation of Jesus for their sins. He took the death penalty for you and me. He took away the second death. He said, I'll bear the death and you will have life. See, that's why Jesus could make that sacrifice. Who was he? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In him was life. He is the source through whom God made the world's. It says God made all things through him. Nothing seen or unseen was made apart from him. And he took of this eternal, glorious life 
and he surrendered it for his creation. He gave up the glory that he had with the Father, though being equal with God, held not on to it, but made himself of no reputation. He came in the form of flesh so that he who knew no sin would be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. See, that's why I said there, this judge doesn't make mistakes because this judge was willing to lay down his life for whosoever would believe in him. That's who sits on the throne. He's worthy to judge. And he's worthy to be the one that examines and looks to render each one according to his deeds. What do they receive? Eternal life. To those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Knowing that apart from God, we have no immortality. Apart from him giving us life, we are mortal. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. Of the Jew first and also to the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good. See, this judgment at the end is different than the judgment that came. We judged ourselves, but now Jesus is judging those who are not his at his coming. And they stand before him, and he does judges everyone, the Jew first and also the Greek. And notice there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now notice this, because what group of people never got the law? The Gentiles, right? They were a group distinct and separate. God gave his word, he gave his commandments to his people, but the Gentiles did not. But notice what it says. So when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are what? A law to themselves. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Did you hear how powerful that is? Who can make a judgment like that other than God? Basically to say, what did you know? You didn't get the law, okay, but what did you know was good? That by nature you were doing things in the law that I can determine were you being good or not. What were you doing? Notice that again. Although not having a law are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. So again, as we continue to answer the question in this message today, what happens to those who are not Christ that is coming? What happens to those who never heard the gospel? What happens to those who never got the word of God delivered to them? See, God is a God that says without partiality. So here's the thing, and here's the treasure. When God lays open his plans to you, if you, if you can see the beauty of the sacrifice of Jesus and the gospel message, if you can see the beauty of his word and his ways, do you realize that that revelation comes for what reason? So that you would be his and bear fruit, that you would be Christ's at his coming. But what if that word never came to you? What if you didn't know? What if you never had the revelation? Is God impartial? Is God not fair? Or is God saying, no, what did you know? What do I know you know? And what does he say? Their conscience, either excusing their behavior or accusing them. Who can judge like this? Because the conscience ends up, for one who doesn't know Christ, actually being a huge part of the evaluation process of the judgment because they didn't know. So what did they know? And he said they, it becomes a law to themselves. See, this is the amazing thing. And my friends, it should spur us in, in a couple ways. One, embrace your calling. Don't compare yourself to the world. They may not be seeing anything. And it would be revealed maybe someday how much you understood. You better just go for it. 
Give your life for Christ. What did Jesus say? Unless you are willing to lay down your life, take up your cross daily and follow me, you're not worthy to be a disciple. That's who the first fruits are. That's who those who are Christ that is coming are. But it should also spur us to never make a comparison with anybody else to say, woe to me if I don't take, it, if I don't take what God has given me and use it in the way I live. Woe to me if I'm trying to be like the world or just keep in pace a bit ahead of the world because you know I'm not as bad as them. It's irrelevant. In fact, in the judgment, it's all irrelevant. Because whose conscience comes into play? What does he say? In between their own conscience bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Wow. God can make a judgment based on that. And so what does he do? It's in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So remember when I was telling you about the resurrection of the dead and this concept of eternal judgment? It's according to the gospel. See, this should be taught to everybody. This is one of the truths in the Bible, and you can read it throughout. There's so much misinformation about the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, or many churches don't even teach a doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, or of this eternal judgment, and yet... Paul's saying, no, this is part of my gospel. This judgment at the end time, this judgment at the end. So there is a resurrection of Christ, then those who are his that is coming, and then the end. When he makes an end to all rule and authority and power, he's going to put down all things that stand against. And all those who offend will be put outside. Notice in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. Why would that be of significance? But notice, who will bring both to light and hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. Jesus Christ will make judgments according to the will of God, appropriate for every person. Now notice this in Jesus' teaching. It says here in Matthew 11, verse 20 to 24, it says, Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. There's a concept of judgment that we just read about, your own conscience accusing or excusing, but also to whom much is given, much is required. What did you do with what you knew? What did God reveal and show? So he says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. What? You mean Jesus doesn't actually need to see? He knows that? He knows that if these works had been done in their society, they would have repented? Now that should give you a tremendous comfort in knowing that Jesus can see how to judge and he can understand what's in a heart. He doesn't actually have to see it in action. He already knows the secrets. I think this is a really cool part of understanding who the judge is in all of this. Because Jesus is saying they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment. The lawless, basically, who didn't have the word of God. It's going to be more tolerable for those people than what? Than for you. You who had the word of God. You who could be following. You who could be seeing Jesus Christ. You who are seeing the works of Jesus Christ and not following. You see, this is where these scriptures of Jesus could be so impactful for us in our own lives. Are we looking at who Jesus is in our lives and living according to that without consideration of what anybody else is doing, but our own hearts accusing or excusing by the word of God, by the leading of his Holy Spirit, and what we do completely and wholly unto him? Because that's the heart, again, of a Christian, wholly committed to God. But here it says it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, you'll be brought down to Hades, that is, down to the grave, down to the ground. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, we know what happened to Sodom, right? If the works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. When I was asking you to remember earlier what we were reading there back in 
in Jude, remember, he, he was saying, he was setting an example of fire, but, but he's saying if these things had been done, they would have turned. But I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And notice, even what he's thinking there, has Sodom come to their day of judgment yet? Nope. Still to come. And he's telling what's going to happen with Sodom and you in the day of judgment. Now notice this in Luke chapter 10, verse 12. I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom, again Jesus speaking, Luke 10, 12 to 16. It will be more tolerable for the day of Sodom and for that, uh, than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. Now notice this. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. In other words, what Jesus is saying to the disciples and as the message goes forward, when the message goes forward now and you hear it, you're responsible for it. So he, he who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects him. That is God the Father who sent Jesus Christ. So there is responsibility again According to what you know, a conscience can excuse or accuse in the day of judgment when the secrets of the heart are revealed. But notice there is responsibility here. Now notice this. The men of Nineveh, right? Remember Jonah was sent to Nineveh? What are they going to do? They're going to rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. When do they rise up? They rise up together. In the judgment. See, I want us to address this because one of the teachings that I heard so strongly again and, and is very common is that when people die, if they don't believe, they go to hell. They're burning forever and ever because they didn't accept. They haven't even come to judgment yet, my friends. They haven't even come to judgment yet. So the men of Nineveh, who are all dead, who repented at the words of Jonah, they just heard Jonah coming through. Right? He had a simple message. Repent. Remember, Jonah didn't think they would do it. Jonah didn't even want to go. He's like, this, this city's crazy. But what did the people do when they heard Jonah preach? They repented. And they're going to rise up with this generation, Jesus says. And when they rise up in the day of judgment, they're going to condemn this generation. They're like, we accepted Jonah? You had Jesus. What did you see? What did, what, what, what did you see? What, what did you not regard? And you see, this is such a powerful thing because Jesus is letting us know about the hearts of people. And he's prophesying here something, saying, they didn't have as much, but what they did have, they, they took it and they repented. See, and God spared that city. God spared those people. Because God is not an unjust God. He knows what's going on in the heart and mind. Don't you love that, that even when Samuel went to anoint a king from the house of Jesse, and all of them started appearing, and he told Samuel, don't look on the outer man. God doesn't look on the outer man. He looks at the inner heart. And then he had him anoint David as king above all his brothers. God knows. See, there's no hiding. There's no playing games with God. And what is he looking for? Honesty, sincerity of heart that we would judge ourselves, that he would not need to judge us. Look here, it says, a greater than Jonah's here. Notice the queen of the south, continuing on here in Matthew 12, will rise in the judgment with this generation, and she'll condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. So even look at how Jesus is talking about those that are coming up. But I also want you to notice the timing of Solomon timing of Jonah, those are different generations. When you think of Tyre and Sidon and Capernaum, and you think about the different uh, lands and the different times that God has dealt with people, whether it's during the time of Abraham or in the Genesis, or talking about the times of the, the kings with uh, Solomon, 
These are different generations rising up together in a day of judgment. It's all yet to come, my friends, just as Jesus prophesied. All right, let's look at here in Luke 11. So and while the crowds were th uh, thickly gathered, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. And the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Matthew 10, verses 14 to 15. Whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So notice here a principle. Again, what was their response to the gospel? Did they hear the gospel? Did they know the gospel? Did they understand the gospel? Their thoughts are going to accuse or excuse in the day of judgment. What did they do with what they knew? Matthew 16, verse 15 to 16, he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. What did you do when you heard the message? Did you receive it? Did you believe it? Notice this now, in addition to the gospel. Judged by your own words. Jesus taught in Matthew 12, 36 to 37, I say to you that for every idle word man may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So there's a very powerful and very clear statement from Jesus about what happens in the day of judgment. You give judgment. You're judged by your own words. Now, I want you to notice how this is building on what it says in Romans, because it said that your own conscience would accuse you or excuse you. Jesus is adding and saying, by your own words, you are going to justify or condemn. Basically, what did you do? What did you speak? What judgment were you pronouncing in your life on others that comes back in the day of judgment? See how he does that? Notice this. Uh, well, we already talked about conscience, so let's go through that. Judge by what they did with what they knew. Luke 12, verses 47 to 48, it says this. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But notice, he says, but he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. In other words, Jesus is saying the measurements, he knows how to measure based on what was going on in your heart, in your head, in your mind, in your understanding, he can make a righteous judgment of the dead, the rest of the dead. For everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So again, a strong principle of judgment. Judged as you judge others. Notice in James 2, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. True? Yes. He who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. What is the punishment for transgressing the law? Death. There is now a need for life. There is a need for mercy. Everyone needs the mercy of Jesus Christ. That is where we have come as those who are his. But also notice this. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Don't you love that about the Lord? Do you remember even when he revealed his name to Moses, when Moses said, show me your glory? What did he do? He said, Yahweh, Yahweh God. What did he say? Merciful. The first declaration that he made to Moses, declaring his name, and then the next thought, merciful, compassionate forgiving. That's the nature of our God. He is a God of love and mercy. He does not desire condemnation. He desires life. And so that's the mindset and the heart of our, of our God. Notice in Matthew 6, 14, 15, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Notice in Matthew 18, 
Then the, his, uh, Matthew 18, 32 to 35, this is in the parable talking about the two servants, one who was forgiven much by the master, more than he could ever possibly repay, and then the, the same servant did not forgive a fellow servant who owed him a lot, but it was a payable debt. And he said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So there is something about this judgment of heart. What was done to you, it'll be brought back. Notice here in Luke 6, 37 to 38. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. That's how the principles of fairness and equity and impartiality and judgment work. As you've done, so be it. In a sense, you see what God is doing here. He's showing those uh, and showing what his judgment is like that as you did it to others, Jesus is going to put it right back on you. By your words, you either justified or condemned yourself here. By the way you thought about things and what you did with what you knew, you justify or you're guilty. And Jesus gets to make the judgment from a heart of mercy and compassion and a desire to give life. There's no one more qualified. He'll do the perfect will of the Father in judgment. Notice here in Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. So when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and the nations will be gathered before him. I want you to notice this as well, because if you look at this in kind of the context that we read there in Revelation, there's a time of the gathering of all nations before him and the separation that takes place. And the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? I was hungry, and you gave me food. That's a beautiful good work, isn't it? I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Notice that the judgment here with all the nations before him is based on what? Works. What did you do? Were you showing mercy? See, he said mercy triumphs over judgment. Aren't all these acts acts of mercy? They're all thinking of somebody who's wrong. And you know, you could say, well, maybe you're hungry because you're not doing the right things, pal. Maybe you need a drink because, right? We humanly can make all kinds of judgments. Well, you're, well you, you deserve to be sick. You're not eating very well. Oh, you deserve to be in prison. You committed a crime. What, but what is he saying? You, you showed mercy even in these circumstances. You weren't judging. You were loving. You see? But notice what the response is, Jesus says, in this judgment. The righteous will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you? Did they ever see him before that day? You see, the judgment at the end, it says that he will sit on the throne, that he will judge all the rest of the dead. See, we who are Christ's, we know who our Lord is. We know exactly what we're doing when we serve one another. When I serve you, it's like serving Jesus, right? We know these things. But here the righteous are saying, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me. I think that's the biggest wrath and judgment 
when the Lord says to those, depart from me. Because there's nothing more empty in my thought, in my heart, having known the Lord, to say, you're going to say, depart from me? That's a, that's a statement you never want to hear. Depart from me. Indeed, you cursed into the everlasting fire. And that's why I said, what did we read in Revelation? That those who had done, who had, whose names were not in the book of life, what do they receive? They get cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And Jesus is saying this is where it comes down. Where the, de uh, where the devil was cast in Revelation, and we see also what it says here. Jesus says, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's where you go. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they will answer saying, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not minister to you? And he will say, surely I say to you, and as much as you did it, uh, did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go into, away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. What is eternal punishment? It's the second death. That's it. Cast into the lake of fire, the second death, or into eternal life. The choice is life and death. God is a God of great mercy, of great love, and a perfect understanding of the secrets of men's hearts. And I hope as we've gone through these verses today, you've seen some things that not only teach you about how Jesus will judge at the end, but also just about how we can be judging ourselves today before him and understanding that our words do matter that our conduct matters. What are we doing? Last week, Scott talked about pure and undefiled religion, to keep oneself unspotted from the world, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. What was Jesus basically saying? How did you treat other people? How did you live on this earth? Is it a reflection of Jesus or not? And ultimately, as we had to accept Jesus Christ and come to him, in order to have life, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So everyone who rises up, all the rest of the dead, they also will stand before Jesus Christ, and he will make a determination on their lives. And it will only be through his mercy and his granting of life that any will have life before him in that day. And those whose names are written in the book of life, they will enter in to the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world, and those whose names are not in the book of life, they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death, and then death itself will be destroyed. That enemy will be completely conquered, and a kingdom will go on where there is no more sorrow, no more pain, no more curse, no more death, because the former things will pass away. God has a very clear and a beautiful plan for us people. Let's teach it in the truth. Let's talk to people about what the plan is and what the gospel of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment is, just like Paul did. These are things that God has been wanting to make plain. But God is not some God who says, well, you never had the opportunity to hear the message. Go be tormented forever and ever in a hell. You won't find that in your Bible you will not find that in there. It doesn't exist. It's a fable that has come into the church and it actually speaks very poorly of our God to think that he would determine that those who had no chance to hear the word as, as those who heard the word and became believers, that somehow he would just say, that's it, you're gonna be tormented for millions of billions of ongoing years because of the choice you didn't have the chance to make in your 70 years of life. See, that's why I think it's a hideous doctrine. And it's unfair to God, it's untrue. And ultimately, our God knows all. He created all, and he is love. And when he raises those up to judgment who have never heard, he'll make the perfect judgment for their life. You can be assured of it, because he is God. And he knows the secrets of men's hearts. Let's finish here in 2 Corinthians 5. 
It says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Here's the biggest difference in that for those who know Christ and are Christ that is coming and those who come up at the end. For those who know Christ, we pass from death to life and we stand. And as it says in 1 Corinthians 3, based on what we've done, we have done, we will be rewarded according to our works. And even if all the works burn away, what does it say? Even if it's all lost in 1 Corinthians 3, it'll be burned up, but you'll be saved, yet so is through fire because of your faith in Jesus Christ. But how did you build on it? You'll be rewarded according to that. But for those who did not know Christ, they also will be judged to receive the things done in the body according to what they have done, whether good or bad. They will receive that too and be granted life or not based on what they have done and the way that the Lord would choose to judge. So knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, you hear Paul in that? We persuade men, but we are well-known to God, and I trust are well-known in your consciences. So we take the message of Christ and the cross, and we preach it. We teach people that we follow Jesus Christ because when you come to have faith in him, you pass from death to life. And you and I are to share that message wherever we go and always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us and to teach people the gospel of truth and to show the way that Christ laid out for us that there is a way of life that we're called to be in his presence now and in the future at his return forevermore. And as Paul said, let us not be ignorant about these things, but rather let us comfort one another with these words.